Well, thank you so much, Pastor White, for the opportunity to be with Grace Baptist Church virtually. And we were really looking forward to being in Canada, but uh, we're so grateful that God has uh, crossed our paths. And amazing how God brought Lance to our church in Dublin. I was shocked when another independent Baptist walked in the door. And then uh, God connected our churches through Soul Winners University, where you guys were an incredible blessing. And uh, the Lord really used that to, to add a soul winning emphasis to our church. And uh, I'm really grateful uh, to see. I wish we could be with you to greater see your heart for the world. But thank you so much. And uh, Lord willing, we look forward to being with you in person. But uh, I want to share a truth with you that really does have to do with missions work and soul winning that has greatly encouraged me, greatly humbled me and challenged me in the area of gospel work. And it is simply the principle of sowing and reaping. And so let me read John chapter 4, which I believe is one of the clearest texts on the subject. John chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 35. John chapter 4 and verse 35 reads, Say not ye, there were yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. And look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to open your word. And Father, I am not worthy for the privilege of preaching. But Father, I pray you'd use your word to challenge and to illuminate your working in our world. Father, please quicken again our belief in the power of the gospel. And I pray, Father, that this might not be merely a message for the mind, but it might move my feet, and it might move our feet to action. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have grown up as a missionary kid in the country of Ireland, and I'll be honest, when I come to uh, the idea of gospel work, the idea of missions, more often than not, my tendency is to approach missions with a sense of obligation and with a sense that I must do this. And indeed, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, there's no way around it. For a, for a Bible-believing, obedient follower of Jesus Christ, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, we must go. How then shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? We must share the gospel with them. And, and I, I, I tend to be more of the quieter type, and I really wish uh, I could dot my I's and cross my T's and uh, go to church and read my Bible in the mornings, and I wish that was the, the limit of what I was required to do. But we must go. We must have a part while the time is so short and, and we see that Jesus Christ is coming so soon. We must go. But that is not the only reason we must go. Obligation ought not be our only reason Though it is vital, rather, Jesus is calling his disciples in the weariness of ministry. He calls them aside in verse 35 and he says, I don't want you to see only the obligation, but I want you to see the opportunity that all around you, literally the fields are bursting with opportunity. And I believe so often we don't throw our lives into gospel work. We don't throw our hearts into, into supporting missions and, and, and encouraging missionaries and however God would use us in that gospel work because 
we're not really persuaded of the opportunity. I know growing up in Europe, and I think probably in Canada, uh, in cultures that have never, at least in Ireland, never really experienced a, a great revival. There's, there's a foreignness to gospel work, and, and it seems almost as uh, my dad has often said, as if you're carving it out of a rock, people don't seem open, and yet we can approach the harvest fields understanding that they are bursting with opportunity, not because of our ability, but because of God's power. And God will quickly bring us to the point of John 15. For without me, ye can do nothing. But we also understand with God, all things are possible. So I believe Jesus is teaching the, the opportunity of the harvest. But then he's also teaching the principle of the harvest. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, Jesus gives the picture of the harvest for his sowing fields, for gospel work. He says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I had a fellow, we have a fellow uh, missionary in Ireland, and someone asked him, um, he was out knocking on doors, and this man asked him, he said, have you ever seen uh, somebody come to the church from your door knocking efforts? Now this was his situation, and um, he, he answered very bluntly, he said, no, I've never seen somebody come to our church where we're presently at because of door knocking, even though we go every week. And that man was so struck, he never went on the doors again. And the pastor became so discouraged that for a, for a period of time, he didn't go out on the doors. And so often, we don't see the opportunity of the harvest because we don't understand the process of the harvest. And John chapter 4, verse 37, the Bible says, And herein is the saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. So look at with me first the persons of the harvest. The persons of the harvest, one soweth and another reapeth. We understand that the sowers and the reapers are two different people. And we understand that the sowing and the reaping works are two entirely different processes. And if, if we combine them, and if we l think that we have to reap when we sow, can I tell you, we'll be discouraged because that's not how God works. And we'll talk more about, I believe, why God has the principle of sowing and reaping. But we must understand that there is a sowing work. What is the sowing work? The sowing work, very simply, is the broadcasting of the seed. It is the heralding, the preaching of the gospel, and it is getting the gospel out in whatever means possible. It is the preaching of the gospel message. It is the sharing of Christ on a street corner. It is the sharing of Christ with a family member. But the sower sows, trusting God will work. And I would like to bring... Two points of why can a sower sow trusting God will work? We must understand that the sowing is a profitable work. Even though he is not concerned with reaping, a sower can sow in faith because of the power of his seed. Isaiah 55, 11, it says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And though my apologetic, or though my introduction into <clears throat> the truth of the gospel has done little to change a hardened heart, we must understand that we hold in our hands the awesome power of God's word. And when my introduction and when my eloquence if you will cannot change their hearts let us never lose the conviction that god's word is able to break the hardest heart the bible says for my word is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so the sower can sow excited about what God's going to do, even though he never sees the results of his work, but confident that God will use what he's doing because it's God's word. And God has promised it will not become, return void. But also, we can sow trusting in the presence of of the Holy Spirit. Would you turn over just a few pages to John 16 and verse number 7? It is the promise of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And so the sower enters the harvest fields, understanding that God is going to do a great work because the Holy Spirit has gone before. God promises that the Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father draw him. But he also said, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself, referring to Calvary. And we understand God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance. And so God has sent his spirit into our world today, and he is currently convicting of sin and of judgment, and if somebody will just go with the word of God, even though they cannot see the harvest fields, God is looking to do an abundant harvest. And I look on the harvest fields of Ireland, and I think, how can, how can an abundant harvest ever come? They're so hardened to the gospel work, so closed to what they deem religious and yet, because God is working, the sower can sow, trusting God will work. Verse 38, Jesus told his disciples back in John chapter 4, verse 38. He said, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye, enter, ye are entered into their labors. Disciples, I've sent you out and you've enjoyed an, an, an abundant harvest. And I believe this is also looking towards Pentecost where thousands will turn to Christ because of their preaching. And Christ tells the disciples in very clear terms, praise God for what he is going to do. But disciples, I want you to know that what you're going to see is only possible because other men went before you. And by the way, they never saw the results for their work. And we understand God is looking for laborers. God is looking for availables who will go and sow the word of God, understanding I may never see the results of, of, of what I do. I may never see the results of passing out the tracks. But I am so persuaded in the power of God's word, I'm going to sow, and I'm going to sow, and I'm going to sow. And the Bible says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And we understand there is also a reaping work. What is the reaping work? The reaping work is that work of, that final work of bringing that soul to Christ. The guiding, the careful work of, of leading the soul to Christ and and. And ensuring they understand it is not of works, lest any man should boast, but simple faith in Christ alone. And I've had the wonderful privilege of leading souls to Christ only to have the thought in my heart when they're truly trusting in Christ. This seems too easy. It's almost, they want to be saved. It's, do you fully understand? And... And, and I'm sure you've had that privilege. But I believe God gives the principle of sowing and reaping because the reaper reaps recognizing God has worked. The reaper reaps understanding that what he has done is very simple as well. It is simply leading the soul to Christ, but it is God who has changed their heart. 
Why does God give the principle of sowing and reaping? First, Paul says uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. Why does God have a sowing work and a separate reaping work? It is so that no person can say, look what I did. No, we must all fall on our faces and say, to God be all the glory, great things he hath done. I was simply an available, faithful servant. God gives here, I believe, a wonderful, encouraging in truth as well. Because if the sowing work is so profitable, the sower can sow. And no gospel effort, truly gospel effort, no tract is wasted because a sower is focused on his sowing. And the success of a sower is not in the results. Rather, his job assignment is simply the volume of the seed. And I'm, I'm not saying that we simply suggest the gospel. We must, uh, we must teach them the gospel and then we must lead them to a decision. But I am saying that there is a principle of sowing and reaping. That is the, uh, the persons of the harvest. We see the two different people. But then let's see also just three uh, simple principles of the harvest. Uh, first, uh, verse 37, and hearing is the saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. And this is probably the most obvious truth, but first of all, you don't reap when you sow. You don't reap when you sow. And so many believers become discouraged. No doubt, if you're a Christian for any time at all, you've gotten excited about gospel work. The need is all around us, and we get excited, and we pass out gospel tracts. And if we're not careful, we're looking to reap when we sow. But, but God says there are two different processes. Why does God give the picture of the harvest? Well, I grew up in Dublin, and we don't have many gardens. And so, um, but if I got my facts right, the sowing is in the spring, and the reaping is in the harvest. Well, what's in between? It's summer. It's time. And we must understand that there will be reaping if we sow, but our expectation ought not be to reap when we sow. But also, this is probably the, the harder truth, the second principle that that really helped me to understand and encouraged me and just being a personal soul winner. You don't reap where you sow. John 4, 37, And herein is the saying true, One soweth, and another reapeth. And if we understand the principle of sowing and reaping, we might come to the idea that Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a laborer, and I'm going to labor in God's harvest, and I'm going to have my little garden, and I'm going to tell these people about Jesus Christ, and I'm going to lead them to Christ. And God very quickly reminds us, no, it's not me in my garden. Rather, it's me, a laborer, in His garden. He is the Lord of the harvest. I am simply a servant. And so God ordains this principle of the harvest, and he says, I'm going to have you sow over here, and then I'm going to have you reap over there. And then I'm going to have you sow a little bit more over here, and then I'm going to have you reap over there. Why? So that we can explain it. God is not looking for experts. He's looking for availables. He's looking for faithfuls. And God says, so that you don't take the credit, so that you give me the glory, I'm going to have you sow here, and I'm going to have you reap in another place. And if we approach gospel work focusing on reaping where we have sown, can I tell you, our gospel, our fruit is going to be very limited. But if we sow, and sow, and sow, and leave the results with the Lord, trusting that His Word cannot come back void, and we sow, 
And then we reap when we give God the glory. I believe God is able to do a great harvest work. We don't reap when we sow. We don't reap where we sow. But thirdly, we do reap if we sow. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, But this I say, that he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, but he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse 39, excuse me, verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit into life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. I love that those two words, rejoice together. And I believe if we're going to be used of God, if we're going to get busy about God's gospel, I'm going to truly get in God's harvest fields. I must go with the understanding that I probably will not see this side of heaven the results that God uses me to sow His Word. But I understand that if I go, God is going to do a great work. I don't understand it. I just trust Him. And we must trust Him. And then when God does get allow me to see the results of what He has done, may we give Him all of the glory. We don't reap where we sow, but we do reap if we sow. And I love the words, rejoice together. Because we understand that the soul winner's crown is the, is the crown of rejoicing. And there is so much joy if we'll just go in faith and say, Lord, I'm not much. Lord, I'm, I'm not a professional, but Lord, I'll go. And Lord, I, I may not see results, but Lord, I'll be a sower. And God is looking for simple laborers in His harvest. But let us see, just in closing, the practice of the harvest. The practice of the harvest. Chapter 4, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And if you can't, and I can't share that perfect gospel witness, can you at least tell, tell them what Christ has done for you? And so this lady runs into her city. Look what Jesus did for me. And, and I love that the witness and the evangelism was not done by the 12 disciples who, who knew and had studied with Christ. Rather, it was done by the excited believer who was persuaded, He hath done great things for me. And so she goes into the city. And I love... Verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said it unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. And so, the Samaritan woman, she runs into her city, and there were some in the city of Sychar who were so burdened because of the emptiness of life, so convicted over their sin, they were looking for the Messiah. And when she told them of Christ. They were ready. The Holy Spirit had been working on their hearts and they believed, the Bible says, because of her own word. And we come back to the truth. If we'll just go all around us, though we don't see them, and though the disciples didn't see them, they are white, all ready to harvest. I, I love that. But then she also found that there were others who were not so persuaded. There were others who weren't so anxious to hear of the Messiah. They had what they needed. They, they weren't concerned for the Lord. But what she said sparked something in their minds to consider more. 
And they go out and we come back to the, again to the other truth that when our words can't change their minds, they are, they are powerless. God's word is able. And the Bible says, and many more believe because of his own word. And so let us again go forward with a conviction that God's word is able to change the hardest hearts. But then they take this lady aside and it's almost humorous. It seems almost rude in a sense. They say, hey, lady, Samaritan woman, they, thank you for telling us of Christ, but, 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 but we want you to know that we didn't believe Christ because of what you said. You, you didn't change our minds. No, we heard the Lord, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. And so they told, told the lady, Listen, you haven't changed our minds. And so we understand with this group of people, she didn't reap. She, didn't, she wasn't the one who reaped, but she did get to reap because she was faithful to sow. And so we must understand as we, as a missionary, a missionary's job is to go where the gospel has not been preached and so, so many missionaries get discouraged when they don't reap when they sow. That we must go armed with the conviction of God's power, of His Word, and of His Spirit. And then if we'll just go and sow, and trust Him to work, and leave the results with Him, and continue to sow, and sow in faith, God is looking to bring about a tremendous harvest. My question is to you is, Will you go? Are you armed with a conviction in the power of God's word that if, if somebody will just go and labor, God is able to do a great work? Will the missionary persevere where God's placed him diligently, understanding that God is able? Will we be available servants, full of faith, full of simple faith, Understanding that God wants to bring a great harvest. I'm just trying to challenge you. What is your place in God's harvest? Are you willing to be a sower? I believe if God's people, wherever God's placed them, wherever God is calling them to, if they'll just go and be obedient servants and understand that God is working to bring a great harvest, I believe, for His glory. And because He is not willing that all should perish, but that all should come to repentance, He will do a great work. Can I ask you, what is your part in God's harvest field? Thank you.